so we can spend an eternity in heaven. Brothers, uh, I'm Chris Bryant, senior pastor here at uh, Ringled United Methodist Church. I want to make sure, yeah, that's on. Uh, and so uh, I'm delighted to see each and every one of you in person uh, today. Thank you for choosing uh, to be here. We have experienced uh, another round of uh, COVID among our schools. And so uh, we got word later on this week, you're like, oh, this family's out, this family's out. I was like, it's okay. I'm grateful that you're here and you're well. Thank you. And uh, for those, of course, that are worshiping online, it's good to see you. That's, uh, we're grateful of any time you worship with us. So we have come to the quintessential question of our why theme. Why Jesus? I mean, of all the questions, and we're going to ask more why questions, but this is the one that's paramount, isn't it? Why Jesus? And, and at this point, you probably would expect of a typical sermon, or, or maybe you would expect this, that the immediate response would be me to start talking about, you know, uh, sin and death and the cross and heaven and hell. But, but would you be surprised that when asked... Typically, less than 5% of people report uh, that the reason that they accepted Christ or professed faith in Christ, less than 5% reported that being a fear of hell. In fact, most of the time, the, the majority of responses when people ask why Jesus, uh, of those who have professed Jesus, who have accepted Him, the, the vast majority, over half, will say something about the joy that Jesus gives them. Or the peace that they feel right here now in the midst of whatever they're going through, their, their life in general. A good third of folks responding will typically say something about their calling or their, the sense of purpose they have, that, that, that somehow they feel connected to God. Right here now, the, a sense of the divine, a, a presence of God in their life here in this place, and that, that they feel wrapped up in that, that there's something calling them purposeful in this life through Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? I think this is so important, not the least of which, for the reason being, not the least of which, that we, in offering the gospel to people, need to keep this in mind and as far as how we go about doing it. It's also really important because we should ask, what did Jesus himself talk about? You know, when it comes to the good news about him, why don't we not ask the, what was the good news that Jesus himself proclaimed? Oh, what is it those things that Jesus said of himself? How did he describe himself? What is it mean, those metaphors that he used? How did he describe his mission? And as we look at the New Testament as a whole, specifically in Acts, the story of the church, what do we find there? What is being off, uh, emphasized as people are offered Christ? I think these are important questions, and so we are to be careful that we don't artificially disconnect the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the gospel we find in Scripture, with maybe what we've learned from a religious perspective or what we've learned in a religious way that we're supposed to say or supposed to talk about. Reducing faith to slogans and bumper stickers is never a good idea. And between you and me, Jesus is way more than an oversimplified statement about salvation. These are big things worthy of talking about salvation and, and, and God and, and grace. And these are huge concepts, and they're worthy for us to make them huge and not oversimplify things, but to to live in the tension of the complex and the nuance and the sophistication and the beauty of God. Or to put it a different way, maybe a more straightforward way, we need to be offering people Christian spirituality. People today are highly skeptical of organized religion, and they have good reason to be. But that doesn't mean they're not spiritual or that they don't consider themselves interested in spirituality. And so what we have to offer them is spirituality from a Christ-centered point of view. And what is that? What view is that? The view is this, everybody needs Jesus. That's what we believe. We believe everybody needs Jesus, not just those people who have yet to accept Him, but everybody, including the folks that have already, in fact, the folks that already have accepted Him maybe need Him even more. <laughs> we need Jesus. May we never be swayed from pursuing Jesus by, talk, by some who would talk about Him or offer Him to others in such a way that would essentially mean or indicate somehow that once we accept Him, we're somehow done with Him. What I mean is this. Some who accepted Christ may have actually just accepted a personal escape plan in the event of their death. And that's not Christian spirituality. That's not Christian spirituality. That's more like a personal consumer product, something that is offered on infomercial on TV late at night. Listen, Jesus of Nazareth is no fire insurance plan. He is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He is the Lord. In Him we are offered not insurance, but assurance 
of a transformative relationship with God, something that can't be broken even by our own death. And it is something that invariably affects all the other relationships in our life. Christian spirituality is this, people need Jesus, not just the eternal life God offers in a name, they need Him. You know, when I run into people that talk about Jesus and faith in Him, uh, only to the extent that they, you know, it's like the only thing they could talk about is like His death on the cross, this idea of sin, and, and specifically how He gives them eternal life. And that's all they ever talk about. You know what it makes me f- feel like? It makes me, it puts me in mind of somebody that just like overcooks their vegetables over and over again, just boils the vegetables down. Now, it doesn't make the vegetables something other than what, you know, the vegetables, but, but you, gosh, you, you've boiled out all the nutrients. You've boiled out all the stuff that's good for you. Yeah, it still looks like it's supposed to look, or sort of, you know, but all the stuff that's supposed to be good for you, you've, you've boiled away, you've taken away. What people are missing out is the fact that in Jesus, we come to know and love and serve God, the God by whom He has revealed in His life and His death. You might remember that Jesus himself warns that, that this is a mistake that people can make. He says that there'll be some who, who will say, you know, Lord, Lord, right? And, and he'll, have to, he'll say at the judgment, I never knew you. I mean, for those of us that say we know Christ, does Christ know us? For those of us that say, I have Jesus. Yeah, I, I've accepted Jesus. Yeah, but did Jesus have you? Does Jesus have you? Does Jesus belong, do, do you belong to him? Or to put it a final way, the Jesus way, you might say, what do you make of all this kingdom of God stuff? I mean, he talks a lot about it. You know, in fact, that's what he came preaching. What do you make of it? What do you make of all this kingdom of God stuff, all these parables that he tells and, and all the descriptions? And, and what, what do you make of it? You think it's a place somewhere out there, somewhere away from us? Or do you think he's trying to describe a, a new way of being? A new reality that somehow is, is, is part of where we are today, but, but not quite. Something that we can actually be born into and see somehow things that other people don't see. Somehow through Him. Sometimes in being overzealous, some Christians have actually done a misservice to the mission of Christ by offering Christ in such a way that they forget that Christ Himself offered the God who sent Him. The gospel of Jesus is about receiving the God that Jesus fully revealed. His father, the one he called Abba, Daddy, Papa. Christian spirituality is about being born of this God. Persons who are becoming one among this God's people. I will be their God. They will be my people, declares the Lord. This statement is found over and over again in Scripture, specifically the Old Testament. Look at that phrase again, I will be their God, they will be my people. The focus is on God-centered activity upon individuals, whereby those individuals become a people devoted to God. There's not a lot of room here for a spirituality that is self-centered and merely about personal benefits. Let me back up for a moment. And come at the same point from an entirely different angle. How do you know there isn't, how do you know there even is a God? How do you know? And if you believe there's a God, what's that God like? What is God like? What, what do you see God? What, what's the nature of God? What's, this, what's God's character? How, how is God, is God involved in the work in the world? And if so, how? What does that look like? And how certain are you of all this? I want you to stop for a second, no matter what you thought. I want you to pause. And I want you to take away Jesus. I want you just to imagine a moment where Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, all he said and did, who we think of in him, all remnants of his story, just gone. Just take it away. Do you believe in God now? What's God like? How certain are you of God's nature and character? How confident are you that God is at work in the world, especially in light of tragedy and evil? Christian spirituality is an exploration of the belief of the divine and the divine activity in the world as understood in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So many people take for granted beliefs about God. They assume things about God. People, I mean, not just Christians, like all sorts of people. Whether they're of other faiths or not, or oftentimes just kind of a murky, you know, uh, superficial, you know, belief in a God. And, and they'll talk about God's love. And I always think, 
Why do you believe that? Who told you God was love? How do you know? How can you be certain? Why would you think God is love? Or, or they'll talk about, you know, how God is personal noble, the, this personal relationship with God. And I think, that's strange. I'm, you know, my, my degree, my background is in studying religion. If you take away the Christian witness, no religion talks about a personal relationship with the divine. So why do you think you can have one? Well, that's, that's a bizarre concept that every person can have a relationship with the God of creation. Are you serious? I mean, you know, well, why would you ever believe that? Or an afterlife. You know, there's such a popular belief that somehow there's a life after this one and, and that we would somehow know in some way others that, that we knew before. And, and, and there's this kind of general sense of that that's, that may be the way it is. And I think, why would you believe that? Where did you get that? Who told you this? How confident are you? Why, why would you be confident in that? Because all these things are uniquely Christian concepts. All of them. The hope and belief that goodness, not just rightness, but goodness will triumph over evil. That ultimately, ultimate goodness will triumph eternally is a Christian concept, namely because of the resurrection. We believe that no matter how bad things get, evil doesn't have the last word, and that this is in fact how love overcomes all that is wrong, by self-sacrifice, and then turning it inside out. What narrative could we do, could we create? What narrative would we look for? What narrative could we find that would replace the hope that would, would come anywhere close to motivating us to believe that despite the tragedy all around us and evil and death that we face and our loved ones face, that these things are not ultimately the end. What, where would we go? Take away the witness of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and what do we have left? I wonder if some of us would even believe in God. If we did, what would we believe about God? How certain would we feel? What proof or evidence would we offer that God is, in fact, the way we think God is, and that God acts in the manner in which we hope God does? Many don't want to claim Jesus, but if they're honest with themselves, many of their hopes about God, their ideas about God, what they find valid and worth exploring, worth considering believing in, doesn't come in a vacuum. It isn't coming from some empty space of philosophical quandary. It comes from a real person, Jesus of Nazareth, who was so special and did such alarming and wonderful and even disturbing things that it caused something inconceivable to happen a new kind of spiritual thought, a new kind of spiritual practice to take off, to be formed and to begin in a place that probably would have been the worst possible place to choose in the world, first century Jerusalem, Israel. <laughs> and out of that life and that incredible series of events sprang much of what is believed about God today in general, even though people don't understand that what they're saying is in fact Christian thought. Now, to be completely fair, having said everything I just said, if the master himself were to speak to us today, I think he would say, because he is who he is, he's Jesus, he would say something like, um, you know, Chris, there's plenty of evidence to see the God who I revealed, my father. Just look around. And he would begin to show us all these things in nature and the world and how things are. He would begin to talk to us about the, the law and the Old Testament and the prophets and, and the Psalms. And, and of course, when he was done, we'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There's plenty of evidence. But then we would say, but, but thanks to you, Jesus, we don't see it unless you point it out to us. And when you point it out to us, then we see it. It's so clear. Jesus is the revealer of all things, the translator of all translations, the word of God, the very spoken word, the idea, the presence of God poured into a human being, or to use Jesus' own words, the way, the truth, and life. In Jesus, we receive the God he came to reveal. In Jesus, we receive the God he came to reveal. Jesus means we have a, a picture, the best, clearest, fullest picture of what God looks like, what God expects of us, how a relationship with God could be defined, and the results we might expect from such. 
Without Jesus, any spiritual quest of knowing if there is a God, the nature and character of God, and subsequently how one might know that God, even if it's at all possible, becomes exceptionally more difficult. Why Jesus? Because in Him we receive God. We receive God, whether we're a long way into our spiritual walk or merely contemplating that very first step. Is there a God? Jesus makes the God journey possible. The first Christian said that same thing like this. He's the light of the world. He's, he's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. He's the great physician. He's the bright morning star, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the chief cornerstone upon which all else is built. He's our high priest, the Messiah, the one who is to come, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus helps us to see fully how great our need for God is. And at the same time, Jesus shows us how great his God is to meet our need. And Jesus we find clearly, finally, uh, the voice of what was up until him just but an echo of things we've been sensing perhaps all of our lives. Various thoughts stirred in us innate longings about the world in which we live, the lives in which we lead, how we kind of know that something is off, something is askew, something's not right. We feel it and, and we, it would be absurd not to admit it. That in this world there's innocent people who get convicted and guilty people get off and bullies that find a way out of trouble, victims spending the rest of their life and coping with sorrow and hurt and bitterness. How we spend gobs of energy on lasting relationships and yet nearly always find them difficult to maintain. Countries that invade other countries and get away with it. And how money and power corrupts and destroys and yet the only sin it seems is to get caught and trying to get more of each. Not actually trying to get more. And so, when we're sober-minded, at least, we dream of a world that's different. We dream of where things could get worked out, where societies would be, well, would, they would function fairly and more efi efficiently. And we, we dream of a world where humans not only know what they ought to do, but they would have the strength to actually do it. Jesus helps us see that world. Jesus helps us see that world, and then he invites us to believe in him that's somehow po possible. It's the kingdom of God. And as he invites us to be part of this, this world in which we can see in him as being possible, we're also then convicted by him. At the same time, we begin to realize how we have, part of what we have done and thought are, are part of what's wrong with the world. We see our place in all that is bad and wrong and difficult. And then at the very same moment, as soon as we realize that in him, he reaches out to us in his self-sacrifice. And says, you're forgiven and loved. And in that forgiveness and love, we are made brand new. And he doesn't leave it there. He says, now go, go, be agents and mission of mine. Go into the world and love. Love your enemies. Bless those who would persecute you. Pray for those who would spitefully use you. Be peacemakers and truth tellers and grace givers. Be generous with your lives. And, and be those who would hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is right relationships. Defend the poor. Defend the window. The orphan. Offer up your humanity to your enemy. And in your selflessness and self-sacrifice, have the faith that they'll be humbled by it, even if they don't look like they are on the outside. And even some will be changed by it. The days are coming, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I'm not going to write it on stone anymore or on wood, but I'll actually put it in, inside of people, in their minds and in their hearts. I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. To be God's people, to be God's whole people, we must wholly be transformed. And it takes law and grace, both. It takes law, it takes standards and goals and challenge. And it takes grace, forgiveness and mercy and renewal. And we need both. And we need both the written word, the scripture, an outward and general guide. And then we also need an inward indwelling spirit, a personal connection with God, leaning and empowering us in moment by moment. Other religions promise only part what we Christians believe Jesus has given us to all. To all who receive him, to all who would believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Why Jesus? 
In him, God is revealed. In him, God can be received. In him, we're changed into God's people. I was reminded of a story that I heard a long time ago as a, about a Christian in South China who had a rice field in the middle of a hill. In the time of drought, he used a water wheel worked by a treadmill to lift water from one irrigation system into his field. And he had a neighbor who had two fields below his. One night, his neighbor made a breach into the dividing bank and drained off all the water he had pumped into his own fields. The next day, the Christian repaired the breach and pumped water back into his field. Yet, when the lower fields need watering again, his neighbor simply made a breach again and watered his fields from the field above. This happened three or four times until the Christian approached his neighbor and said to him, I've tried to be patient and not retaliate, but is what you are doing right? He went away and thought about what he'd said to his neighbor and started praying about it. His neighbor had not said anything in response. And, and, and so in praying about it, he realized that if all he had done was seek his own justice with his neighbor, he would, have been, he would be a very poor follower of Jesus. And so the next time when it came for watering, he first pumped water into his neighbor's fields, the lower fields, got them nice and full. Then he pumped water into his own. And he did that every time after. And from that point, two things happened. First of all, he never had to worry again about a breach being made that he'd have to repair. And the second thing is, over time, his neighbor became a Christian. That's Christian spirituality. That's why everyone needs Jesus. Not only in Jesus is God revealed and God able to be received, but in Jesus we're changed into God's own people. And when we are, the world becomes truly good, like what God says in Genesis 1, calls it good, meaning we no longer carry the DNA of a broken creation, but in almost like gene therapy, we are reinfused with the DNA of the loving Creator. As we surrender our lives, as we surrender our mind and our heart and our will to Jesus Christ, we're changed into something that He called and told of His followers, you'll be salt of the earth. You'll be light of the world. You'll be like a city on a hill. I'm wondering, in all that I've said today, did anything stir your heart? Did anything intrigue your mind? For those that might be more skeptical, maybe publicly or secretly skeptical, is it at least convincing enough to say that as far as spirituality goes, it's worthy of exploring this Jesus? I hope so. I know of one person that I deeply respect, <laughs> that he always answers the question, why Jesus, in a very personal way. He always says, well, for starters, why Jesus? Well, Jesus makes me less of a jerk. I think it's critically important that if we speak of why Jesus and talking of accepting him, we do so not just in terms of what we think Jesus offers us, because Jesus is no personal consumer product. Instead, I hope we understand that accepting him means embracing the God he came to reveal and to be transformed by a relationship with the divine in such a way that it would change all the other relationships in our life. And so, if asked, this is my best, most concise answer, why Jesus? Well, because in Jesus, God is revealed. In Jesus, God can be received. In Jesus, through him, we're changed into God's own people. I'm not suggesting that that be your answer. I'm suggesting if you're wanting to look more, it's a great place to start. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you uh, for every person here that at one point in time or another have prayed what might be called a sinner's prayer, or, or, or they've simply come to a place where they acknowledge they believe in you, whether they have a great story about that or whether it just kind of slowly happened over time. Nonetheless, I pray for each person in that category, including me, that we would not get into that place where we're kind of just like using you or we kind of get all mixed up and or we forget what the big picture is all about. Lord, we seek you, Jesus, and the God in whom you reveal, your Father. 
We, we seek to be transformed in every way possible and be part of this mission, this kingdom of God that you talk so much about. To be that salt of the earth and light of the world, to be that city on the hill that you described, that, to Lord, to see what could be through you, to be inspired by it, and yes, at times to be convicted of where we have fallen so short and yet receive forgiveness and renewal and mercy and be inspired and again led by your spirit to go out and be different. For we have found love and hope in you. And Lord, for all those today that have yet to accept you into their life or yet to come to that place where they're really, they're really giving themselves to you, Lord, I pray that something happened in worship today or even in the sermon, that they would feel that nudging in their heart or that, that thought or that heaviness in their mind or whatever it might be, and that right now they might realize it's more than just intellect. It's more than just a preacher preaching that that's you. That's you speaking to them. And may they follow that nudge. continue to ask questions, whatever they need. For as they seek, I know, in you they'll find the way, the truth, the life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.